Welcome to this episode of Disease Du Jour on the topic of veterinarians and equine welfare with Dr. Clara Mason. Dr. Mason is a solo ambulatory practitioner in Winfield, West Virginia, and she serves as the AEP's representative to the AVMA's Animal Welfare Committee. She's presented on the topic of prosecuting cases of equine abuse at the AEP annual convention and, while a member of AEP's Welfare and Public Policy Advisory Council, was part of a team that in 2018 created comprehensive online resources to help members work with clients in law enforcement to prevent equine abuse and neglect. She's a graduate of Mississippi State University's vet school. Dr. Mason was named AEP's Good Works recipient for August 2019. Her commitment to at-risk courses in West Virginia has strengthened animal cruelty laws in that state and increased enforcement of equine cruelty and neglect cases. I'm your host, Kim Brown, publisher of Aqua Management. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2021 by Merck Animal Health. Welcome, Dr. Mason. Hey, thank you, Kimberly, for having me on this uh, podcast. Well, we sure appreciate you uh, coming and sharing some of your experience with us. Let's just start out with, can you tell me about maybe one incident where you were involved in an equine rescue? Yes. So I moved to West Virginia in 1993. And though the laws in West Virginia are very good, and they were a little bit, uh, you know, ahead of everyone statewide as having uh, responsible laws, and you could certainly get your um, case to court if it was necessary. The unfortunate problem in 1993 was that the um, rescues, which there were very few of, uh, the local shelters, and um, some of the law enforcement were just sort of out there unaware of how to get these cases um, from the field to the courtroom. And most of the time it was reflective of the fact that they were not knowledgeable or educated or instructed on what is a skinny horse, what is an abused horse, what is a neglected horse, or what is just typical for the breed and we're misunderstanding it. So through the first few years when I moved here, there were a few cases, um, three horses here, two horses there. Most of the time it was a neglectful situation. And then in um, 2000, the beginning of 2010, I got a panic phone call from a county that um, is located on the border of West Virginia and Kentucky. And it's a little rural out there, but someone had neglected or abused uh, 58 horses. They were starving. The pasture was denuded. They had no vet care. Um, Some of the mares were aborting without even uh, going into a natural labor. They they simply were walking away and losing their pregnancy. Um, And all because the animals were starved. So they contacted me, but this is an enormous amount of horses for one veterinarian to take on and have to take to court. And they had a myriad of problems health, health-wise. Everything that was minor from dermatitis and some hoof issues to um, pigeon fever um, to colic. Again, we had um, st- almost storm abortions, not due to a bacteria or an infectious agent, but rather just a neglectful situation where the mare did not have enough calories to support the pregnancy. So um, when I was called in, our state did not have the resources to manage this. It was just too large. So the Humane Society of the United States came in, ASPCA came in, and um, some other umbrella groups um, beneath both the Humane Society and the ASPCA. And my little practice of uh, two technicians and I were able to um, process all of these horses and get them the proper care and start medicating them. And then we found a local um, fairground that was able to um, allow these horses to live there as they recuperated or were treated. It was a massive undertaking, and I had never taken on anything that large. Unfortunately, again, we ran into the one problem, which is 
okay, we recognize there's a problem. We're treating the horses. We are, you know, putting them in a in a better light. You know, they're they're having some pasture to graze. They're receiving medications, but yet, how do we prosecute or at least, you know, bring the gentleman that had these horses to court? So um, that was a challenge because the shelters were not skilled in how to do this. So this is where I realized that we need to do something as veterinarians to not allow these cases to slip by us because we are the advocate for the horse. And if we don't speak for the horse, who will? So I realized then that my best approach to dealing with these cases is to go straight to the prosecutor. And many times animal abuse cases take a back seat. Obviously there's bigger problems in the world right now with murders and, and all of that. I get that, but many times animal abuse and human abuse, whether it's a child or elder abuse, can run um, hand in hand. So I went to the prosecutor and really just, you know, sat down with pictures, diagrams, you know, whatever they needed and preached to them until I maybe gave them some confidence, for maybe lack of better words, that they could go into the courtroom and, and go with this case. And um, it, it was a challenge. It took us months. Everything worked out well. The uh, man was found guilty. And of course he was denied um, pet ownership for five years, which it took less than a year before he um, unfortunately broke that rule and, and took in more horses and dogs. But um, the county at that point was prepared to deal with him. And this sort of gave them the levy to go forward with other cases like this, because this was just a large case that was all over the news, you know, went into Kentucky as well as West Virginia, and it was high profile. But I knew that if we didn't handle this case properly, we would never get a smaller case of one or two horses to the courtroom. So it really worked out well, and I'm extraordinarily grateful for the national organizations like the ASPCA and the Humane Society and some of the other ones that took their time and sent shelter workers to us. And they would live, you know, here in West Virginia for a few weeks and help take care of these horses because otherwise we'd have, we would have lost most of this herd. So, um, that was really the impetus that got me started on this because I realized that equine neglect and abuse, albeit we're more uh, savvy with it, meaning that we recognize it. We know what a skinny horse looks like. You know, we, we have toolkits to help us with this. And even though we're there and possibly we're not seeing as many uh, abuse cases as we saw a few years ago, we are still seeing them and they still, the horses still need attention. And I believe that you got an award from the HSUS for all of your hard work on this. I, did. I was the only veterinarian in the country that year in 2010. Um, I, they awarded me the Humane Recognition Award um, and it was presented to me in Washington, DC. And it really was, um, unexpected and and very much appreciated it's it makes me smile when i see that award because i know how hard all the teams worked whether they were national or just my small staff um, we really really put forth the effort to save those horses and i still see some of those horses through the practice occasionally and they look great some of them are just as sassy as they can be you know <laughs> <laughs> they have oh, a great full, full belly and an attitude, but um, I probably see maybe 20% of the horses from that rescue. That's amazing. So how can equine veterinarians get involved in welfare? I mean, how is it that usually a veterinarian is brought into one of these situations? 
Today's Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the maker of prestige vaccines, Banamine, Panicure, Regimate, Protozil, and other trusted equine health solutions. Merck Animal Health works for you and for horses. Learn more about Merck Animal Health's comprehensive portfolio of products, as well as their ongoing investment in our industry, profession, and community through programs such as the Respiratory Biosurveillance Program at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. Well, typically, um, if, if you haven't done any equine uh, rescue work or neglect or abuse work, the, um, you're usually called upon when there's a horse that's uh, either in question, you know, is this horse being neglected, or if there's an actual you know, um, there's been egregious abuse. And so you usually get a phone call from a shelter worker, a director, occasionally law enforcement that says, I need help. I had one of those last week. So um, the law enforcement humane worker, he said, you know, I, I can tell you a skinny dog or a skinny cat from 100 yards. He said, but I have no idea if this horse is skinny or not. And the horse's body condition score was a one. So clearly um, he needed some training in this. And he's actually signed up for one of our uh, equine abuse classes that just helps law enforcement or anyone working with horses to uh, recognize some of these problems. But as a veterinarian, if you get the phone call, I often get a phone call after that from some of our uh, AAP members that will say, look, I've never done this before and I don't wanna mess this up. How do I handle this or should I even get involved? Some of the questions that are um, consistently um, thrown out to me are, is this gonna affect my practice? You know, if I stick my neck on the chopping block, will um, my clients stop coming to the practice? Or, you know, is my boss going to take this out on me? You know, whatever. And again, I always say, you know, we're the advocate for the horse. And if we don't help them, no one else will. I can tell you in 29 years of practice, if we have lost any business from uh, dealing with equine welfare, I haven't noticed because our practice has literally improved every year. So um, I, I can't imagine somebody shunning us as a veterinarian because they're afraid we might turn them in for equine abuse. So um, I, I don't think that's as much a problem as we fear that it can be. Um, the other thing that you can do is the AAP has a toolkit that um, you can access either as a veterinarian or if you're into law enforcement or you're a shelter worker, they also have a second toolkit that will help you through this. We also have many resources um, on how to approach, um, you know, going onto the farm. Are you permitted on the farm? Do you take law enforcement with you? There are a lot of publications through the AAP answering these questions. And then of course, any of us that are involved with the equine welfare team, and there's quite a few of us through the AAP, we're all happy to answer any questions that you might have because this may be a novel um you know approach to uh tending to these horses you know sometimes uh, the laws are different state to state and we can kind of guide you with that so if you practice in one state and you can access a farm you know without law enforcement but maybe in the state that you're practicing in now you can't you should be aware of that because oftentimes these cases are lost on small glitches, you know, just a technicality. Either, you know, the person wasn't um, given the right paperwork or you weren't permitted on the property, you know, uh, without guidance through law enforcement. Uh, there, there are many avenues to these glitches and we really try to troubleshoot them. And um, Michigan uh, has a law school that really specializes in animal law. And we try to guide the veterinarians to them because every day they, this, the law school, I, I believe it's just called 
michiganlaw.com. You can Google it. They um, survey some of the rules and regs that are on their website pertaining to abuse in a state. Like, for instance, it, would it be would you charge them as a felony or is this a misdemeanor? So mm -hmm. they have that information on there and you can access it. And as like I said, it's very current. They literally look at it every day. So that's another way to get involved. That's a great resource. Thanks for letting us know about that. Mm -hmm. So let's go to a little more personal question. Why should an equine veterinarian get involved? Uh, veterinarians should get involved because, again, we may be the only person that is the advocate for the horse in, in certain scenarios. I will tell you the one question that we get over and over and over again is, um, do I know enough to go to court? And the answer is yes, absolutely. As equine veterinarians, we are the one person in the courtroom that knows more than any other person. We are the expert. And when you go to court, if you have to go to court, um, have the uh, attorney certify you as an expert witness. And the difference is, is that if you go in just as a veterinarian who's working on a, an equine abuse case, you can answer questions such as, do you think this horse is skinny? Yes or no. Do you think this horse's body condition score is a two? Yes or no. But when you are certified as an expert witness, which I, I can't really think of a reason why we shouldn't be, um, you know, you should not be excluded, then you can, the judge can ask you a question like, hey, Dr. Mason, how long did it take this horse to get this skinny? Or do you think this horse can survive a winter um, in this condition? So that's where your expertise comes in. You are the expert with witness and no one knows more about the horse than you do. And this should give you the confidence to go into that courtroom and know that what you are talking about is a legitimate science and that your opinion matters. Well, that's, that's some great points. So I know that some veterinarians, some equine vets, they're concerned, as you mentioned, about getting involved in some of this, whether it's because they're worried about clients, they're worried about it taking time away from practice, they're worried about, you know, what ramifications they'll have if they show up in court. But can you talk about some of the challenges and how you've addressed them successfully? I think that um, one of the bigger issues that has affected our practice, but I oftentimes will get a phone call on this as well, is the money portion of this. Who is responsible for your salary? Who is responsible for you going to court? Who is responsible for the care and custody of the horses? So I always tell everyone, do not. Uh, assume custody of these horses, meaning that just because you have two empty stalls, it's not your job because you're the veterinarian on this case. It's not your job to take those horses home and care for them unless this is something that you want to do. But again, I would highly recommend that you don't get that close to the case because then there's always that question. And Lord, I've had this come up a million times where the person who has uh, lost their horses and you may be in court with them, the first thing they say is, you want my horses? And I always respond with, no, I don't. I've got three of my own and they're plenty for us. You know, so I don't want your horse. I don't want anybody's horses. And I really recommend that if you can, you separate yourself away from this. You know, whether you have stalls in the backyard or in your clinic. You know, now that's a different story if you're treating the horse. But again, if the horse should go up for adoption, I also recommend that you do not adopt the horse. If your friend wants to adopt the horse and then you want to buy the horse from your friend, that's a better picture or a better scenario than if you straight out go and adopt the horse. 
because then it, it doesn't really bode well uh, for the team if somebody is actually gaining something from this crisis, if you will. So um, the money should be sorted out in the beginning and counties or shelters or if they're going over to the local, um, uh, you know, uh, rescue group, they're the ones who should be responsible for the money. You should be paid whatever you feel, feel is fair. You have to remember that you're writing reports as well. So you're going to have some time doing extra work outside of the field. Um, you also have to remember that you have to go to court. Now, you don't have to bill anybody for your court time until it happens. But then again, um, you want to make sure that you establish either through the prosecutor or whomever's assumed the horses that you're going to be paid because, you know, somebody, this is a job. I mean, this is what we do for a living. So I really recommend that you get all of that established before you jump in. On the off chance that possibly there's no money available, there is federal money out there. And when I say federal, I don't mean really through the government, but uh, there's money, at, or I should say national money, not federal. Uh, there's money out there through different rescue groups. You have to find them. Um, and, you know, this that, that's a late night with a pot of coffee in your computer. But uh -huh. uh, there have been a few uh, vets that have uh, gotten um, or received payment through some of these other groups. Well, it, it sounds like not only a, a very physically time demanding, but an emotionally demanding thing to become involved in some of these cases where these horses, even if it's just through ignorance, have been neglected to the point where they either die or are close to death. You know, and, and that brings up a good point, too. Um, again, because we we obviously enjoy working with horses, um, you know, this is how we selected our, our career choice. Sometimes it's more humane for the horse to be euthanized than to attempt to restore health. Sometimes the damage has been done. And... Oftentimes, you have to remember that if a horse has been, uh, we see this occasionally, uh, you've had a tendon rupture, possibly a fracture, or having a lot of uh, fractured legs recently because there's a band of horses running between West Virginia and Kentucky through the coal mines, abandoned coal mines, and they wander down into the towns, and unfortunately, a lot of them get struck by vehicles. So we're having to deal with some fractures that have healed improperly. So those horses are going to need medication or possibly special leg bandages, you know, whatever the case may be, for the life of the animal. And you have to remember that sometimes ownership uh, changes. So though somebody with the means to take care of the horse may adopt the horse, possibly in a year or two, something in their life may change and they have to rehome the horse. And you're going to have to find somebody that can afford to take care of a horse that is possibly not rideable or usable. So there's, there's a lot to it. And it's hard sometimes to have the frank dialogue with a veterinarian that, you know what, we're better off euthanizing this horse because it's just too painful to try to restore health. And um, don't ever feel guilty for having to make that choice. Often that's the braver choice. And that's a, a good point, you know, that veterinarians have, as you have said several times, they have to be the advocate for the animal because sometimes people will be willing to even put money towards something in the recovery of a horse, but it may not be in the horse's best interest. Correct. So is there, <coughs> excuse me, anything else that you would like to, to advise to veterinarians who, you know, might get involved with an equine rescue or neglect or abuse situation? I really can't think. I mean, everything I spoke about today 
for me has recently been redundant but that is just because so many of these horses are ending up back in the shelters and then the second thing because of covid last year it looked like you know we had zero abuse cases but the problem was is that the shelter workers couldn't go out to investigate so now you know everybody's back to work and they're vaccinated and the abuse cases are on the rise or it seems to be but they're it's not that they're on the rise it's just that we're back to work and uh the second problem is a lot of people adopted horses during COVID when they were working from home. And now the situation's changed, either financially or they've had to go back to work or whatever the case may be. And we're noticing that more and more horses are being returned back to the rescues. Yeah, so, that's, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We have that other problem now, but that's been recently uh, where our phone calls have come in or emails you know hey i need help and this is why yeah well i think this has been some great information dr mason and again and we remind the veterinarians listening to this and other interested folks that the american association of equine practitioners aaep.org has a lot of great resources that can help veterinarians or law enforcement or other folks and as dr mason said those on the welfare committee of AAEP are happy to talk to veterinarians who need maybe some advice on getting involved in some of these cases. So thank you for all this great information today, Dr. Mason. And we want to thank our audience for listening to Disease Du Jour. And a special thanks to our 2021 sponsor, Merck Animal Health. We invite you to listen and rate our episodes of Disease Du Jour on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you have any questions or suggestions, you can email me at kbrown at equinenetwork.com. The Disease Du Jour podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC. 